On today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be doing more repairs and upgrades to this Dragon 32 that I bought spares or repair on eBay. Hello and welcome to Retro Tech Repair. If you're a regular viewer of this channel or you found me via my mate Vince, this Dragon 32 might look familiar to you. I first bought its spares or repair on eBay for the princely sum of £47.06. Since then it's appeared in the 2021 YouTube Fixers Christmas Special over on Vince's channel. Christmas Special we have Roger from Retro Tech Repair and in this episode today he's going to be attempting to fix up a 1980s Welsh computer. If you haven't yet seen that I'd go across and check it out. There's a lot of other great fixes on that video and Vince is a legend among YouTubers. I'm sure you'll really enjoy his content. But at the risk of being a bit of a spoiler, that repair took me absolutely ages and was a nightmare. Having got it working just in time for Vince's editorial deadline, I still have a lot of work yet to do on it. So our case here has a bit of a crack in it. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, that's right here. So I'm going to try and do something about that. You've probably noticed that the Dragon is much cleaner and brighter than it was before, and that's because I'd already cleaned it and retro-brighted it in another video. That retro-brighting went pretty well, which is more than can be said for my attempts to repair the plastic crack by melting the two halves back together. So in its natural state, the crack kind of sits open. What I'd like to do is close it like this, so that it's closed when I try and weld it together. So what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm just going to pop some tape around it, duct tape here and just kind of hold it tight and then I can melt it together with my soldering iron. At least that's the plan. So I've put a scrap tip on my soldering iron. It's actually not a scrap tip. I think it's a new tip. I just really haven't used it. It's a chisel shape that I wouldn't ordinarily use. So I'm going to use that to melt around where I've got the crack in the case here. And I'm not suggesting this is the best way to do it, by the way. It's just something I'm going to try. There's probably better ways of joining this together, which I don't know. This is what I'm going to try. Okay, well, I think that's about as much as I'm prepared to do. So uh, we'll go ahead and let that cool off and then we'll get it cleaned up. And on the outside, the result wasn't quite as good as I hoped. The crack has kind of opened up a bit. So unfortunately, I, I sort of messed that up. Worse than that, my weld, if you can call it a weld, didn't hold at all. It cracked straight away and so I ended up just gluing the case back together using some epoxy adhesive that I'd bought from Poundland. So whilst the case is drying, we're going to turn our attention to the keyboard. This just needs a good clean up. We fixed it in the earlier video. The end result looked pretty good and if only I'd turned on my microphone, I'd be able to tell you all about it. So here is our dragon with its, well, let's call it repaired, crack in the side. Real shame that I didn't just glue it in the first place, but the glue, Actually, uh, epoxy glue, I suppose, seemed to work really well. Good spread of it behind, and now this seems reasonably strong. I'm not going to intentionally flex it too much, but I think it's going to hold for a good while. So the next thing we're going to do is look at the upgrade of the memory. Now, if you've seen the video that I did with my mate Vince, you'll have seen that I replaced all of these RAM chips. So these have now been replaced with a 64K memory chip where the 32k memory chips were and now we need to modify the logic to address those chips. So I downloaded these instructions off the internet and I'll put the link in the description to this video explaining where I got them from. But what I've done is I've highlighted each of the individual steps that I need to take in order to modify the logic of this board to work with the new RAM. So I'm now going to follow each of those. Before I do that however, I do need to get this board out of the enclosure. So here is our main board and I should explain a couple of things first. So when I replaced the RAM chips on this board, I had to put a couple of wire links on. I've not done a particularly neat job of it. So there are some hand mods on this board already. Try and ignore those. I'm hoping I've got a little bit better at those types of mods since I did that. But those are there only because I messed up when I took the old chips out and sometimes that happens. I'm not an expert in these repairs. I'm sure somebody else could have done a better job and I probably should have just cut out the old chips and it probably would have gone much better, but it didn't. And so there's a couple of wire links on there. I didn't show that in the My Mate Vince video because I was very compressed for time, but 
yeah, those had to be done. So now what I'm going to do is I'll just turn the board back over and I'll follow the instructions that I got from the internet for this upgrade. And the first thing that I need to do is check that IC26 is a 6821, IC26 6821, that IC33 is a 74 LS138, uh, 33, 74LS138, and it is. The IC31 is a 74LS02, and it is. And that, well, I guess those are the things that I needed to check. So now that I've done that, I can move on to the first kind of modification, which is join pin 12 of IC31 to pin 3 of IC31. So I made a decision with this repair, and it was only a matter of preference to make the modifications on the rear of the printed circuit assembly so that when it's situated in the Dragon, it looks unmodified. This is entirely personal preference, and I'm sure you can make the modifications on the top of the board, and I've seen that done in other examples that I've watched on YouTube. I'm using enameled copper wire to make the links and relying on that enamel to provide insulation from the rest of the printed circuit assembly. So I'm not cleaning any of that enamel off, I'm just relying on the heat from the soldering iron and the solder to evaporate the enamel at each of the solder joints. And as you can see, I'm using Kapton tape to hold the wires in place while I solder them. And once each joint is made, I cut off the excess with a sharp knife. Having connected pin 12 of IC31 to pin 3 of IC31, I then continue through the instructions on worldofdragon.org and connect pin 2 of IC31 to pin 21 of IC26. I then move on to the final connection, joining pin 1 of IC31 to pin 5 of IC33. And then finally I cut through the connection between pin 5 of IC33 and pin 8 of IC33 using some cutters, cutting through the track on the printed circuit board. So now with my meter on continuity, I can probably go and check this out. So we should have from pin 12 of IC31 to pin three of IC31. That's three and that's 12. And uh, nothing around it either, which is good. And then from pin two of IC31 to pin 21 of IC26. So pin two of IC1 to pin 21 of IC, oh, it's over here, 26. So that's there, and pin two. Excellent. And then from pin one of IC31 to pin five of IC33. Pin one of IC31 to pin five, one, two, three, four, five, of IC33. Excellent, and then cut the connection between pin five of IC33 and pin eight of IC33. So between five and eight, we shouldn't see anything. And we don't, excellent. Okay, well, I think it's time we powered this up and took a look. And if that all works, then I'll probably put some nail varnish or something strategically on the back or some tape just to hold those wire links in place. So here we have the three wire links on the back of the PCB. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see that on the camera or not, but the good news is when we put everything back together, it did seem to work, although I haven't yet been able to test whether or not it's 64K. The reason I didn't do that was because I started to experience some unrelated problems. But when we hook it up to a TV, everything isn't as it should be. There's an awful lot of jittering on the screen and no amount of pot twiddling seems to be able to resolve that. So this is about as good as I managed to get it. There's lots of noise on the screen and there's lots of flickering. The composite picture isn't much better. There's a lot of flickering still and the picture's very noisy. So looking at the printed circuit board of the Dragon, there appear to be two different operational amplifiers between the video generator and the video out. But only one of those appears on the circuit diagram that I've been working from and on the diagram, the rest of the circuitry is made up of discrete components. So I'd already replaced the video generator when I first repaired the Dragon on the MyMate Vins channel. And I'm really starting to suspect these op amps as being the probable cause of the jittering. So this is the op amp that I want to try and replace. And as you can see, it's tucked in amongst some other parts. Now that's going to make it difficult for me to get my soldering iron down there with the desolder braid, but 
I'm going to have to do that because I can't really cut this out and then remove the pins individually. And the reason that I can't do that is because the part that I have to replace it is not an SFC2318DC because I couldn't find one of those. It's something that I hope is going to work but don't know will. And that's an LM318. So because of that, I'm going to have to desolder it carefully, keeping it intact using my soldering iron, some desolder braid and my desoldering gun. So after some considerable effort using my desoldering tool, some desoldering braid, my soldering iron, and an awful lot of patience, I did manage to remove the op amp intact. Then I clean up the area gently with some IPA and a brush, and solder a chip holder in where the old IC used to be, before inserting the new IC into the chip holder. So the LM318 turned out to be a worthy substitute and in fact it works fine but it hasn't fixed our problem and we still have bad video signal coming out. Now googling around and looking at the Facebook posts it seems that in fact the signal from the Dragon 32 was never great and so although it sort of worked on RF of the televisions of the day getting it to work well on composite can be a bit of a challenge because the signal isn't very clean. However, in the meantime, the replacement for this other video op amp arrived, so I'm going to solder that in in just the same way that I did this one, and we'll see if things get any better. My Dragon has two potentiometers that seem to affect the video signal, RV1 and RV2. And it was really just a case of trial and error until I adjusted these and got something I was happy with. Okay, after a lot of messing around with RV2 and RV1 here, I got something that I think looks pretty good. It's connected on RF now, and in fact the image that I'm getting is a much cleaner image than I ever remember getting back in the 1980s when I was using these types of machines. It's pretty stable, it's very bright, the contrast is good, it was definitely worth replacing these two op amps. Now, there is one peculiarity, and that is that I've been unable to find a setting that works really well for both RF and composite. It's as if the composite signal that's taken by this modulator has a different need to the one that's in the television. So, if I hook this up now to composite, and we'll look at the composite signal on the TV, we see that the composite signal actually has a lot more noise on it than the RF one does, which is not really what you'd expect. Now I can get that cleaned up, but to do that I have to adjust this RV2. I get a lovely clean composite image, but the RF image goes away. So I've decided that what I'm going to do is I'm going to live with the suboptimal composite and keep the clean RF, and if I ever want to go back to using just a composite signal, I can tweak this RV2 and get that at the cost of this RF. But because the RF signal is so good, I'm quite happy with that. And when I connect it up to a TV, a CRT TV, it's going to be just like the setup I would have had back in the day. And I like that authenticity. So the Dragon 32 is now working and looking great with a lovely crisp video output. But is it 64K? So of course there are programs that you can type in to test this, but the extra memory isn't readily available to the basic. So a better option might be to load up a 64K game. This is Dungeons and as it loads from cassette we should hear the relay click as the tape stops briefly and then restarts to load the 64K version of the game. Excellent, so it looks like that was a success. So it's been quite the journey for our Dragon 32 and a little bit of a labour of love. From a filthy, forgotten, discoloured and completely non-functioning machine to a clean, refresh and upgraded piece of retro tech that I am very proud of. But that does just about wrap it up for our Dragon 32 today. I hope you've enjoyed the video and that if you have you'll consider hitting subscribe. And until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair. And off we come with a lid.